And uh, we have Dr. Manpreet Kaur. She is an assistant professor in the RP Center in the cornea refractive uh, segment. And she is the one who made this program. And uh, thank you, Manpreet, for involving all of us. Thank and you can you, st deliver your talk. Thank you, sir. So I'll be talking on biometry and IL selection in cataract with keratoconus, no financial disclosures. So we may choose not to do a surface ablation in a patient with keratoconus. We may choose not to go ahead with a fake acyl implantation, but cataract we cannot escape. We all will face cases that have keratoconus and cataract. In fact, they have a greater likelihood of development of cataract at a younger age because of associated atopy, steroid use because of associated vernal keratoconjunctivitis, senile cataract per se is an issue in itself. So there is a stepwise approach when you see a patient of keratoconus with cataract. First establish the diagnosis. Is the blurred vision due to keratoconus or cataract? So do a contact lens over refraction. Do not be in a hasty to treat a mild cataract that can be corrected with contact lens or spectacles alone. Document stability. Determine if the keratoconus is stable or progressive. So you need to have serial topography examinations. Third step is counsel. Again, the patient should have realistic expectations. It is in fact going to reduce the magnitude of the refractive error, not eliminate it completely. So the outcomes that they may see after cataract surgery in their relatives, etc. may not apply to them. Then you come to biometry, IL power calculation and IL selection. What you have to remember is there is a tendency towards post-operative hyperopia, whichever formula you use, whichever keratometry device you use. So what are the challenges in accurate biometry and IL power calculation? The axial length estimation, keratometry, effective lens position estimation, and the formula errors. So before you proceed with biometry, the timing of biometry is very important. A lot of these patients will be using contact lens. You ha have to uh, take into account the contact lens induced corneal warpage. So for soft contact lens, they should be off contact lenses for one week before you proceed with measurements. For RGP hybrid or toric lenses, two weeks. For scleral lenses that do not touch the cornea, two to three, three days is said to be enough. We do take these into account when you're doing refractive planning. We conveniently ignore it when we are doing biometry for cataract. It's as important, the timing of biometry while doing cataract surgery. Axial length, keratoconus is associated with axial elongation and myopia. In fact, the axial length has been observed to have a stronger correlation of the final spherical equivalent than the preoperative K readings in keratoconus patients. So it's more important than keratometry, not less so. A decentered apex in keratoconus, the visual axis estimation may be uncertain and challenging. So what we have seen is ultrasonic biometry is often inaccurate. Optical biometry is the preferred modality as the visual axis determination is more accurate. Then coming to the keratometry challenges. You have the index of refraction error, instrument error, formula error, and irregular T of film. So index of refraction error, the conventional keratometers are based on assuming a fixed anterior to posterior corneal curvature ratio and the standard keratometric index of 1.3375 is used to calculate the keratometry. It does not hold true in keratoconus. The anterior to posterior corneal curvature ratio is altered. Second, the keratometers are inaccurate as the asymmetry of corneal curvature is do not, not taken into account. You have irregular astigmatism. Visual axis and corneal apex may not coincide. Formula error, because a lot of the newer regression formulas are based on effective lens position calculation, which is inaccurate because of a much deeper anterior chamber depth, a higher axial length and steep corneas, and again, the visual axis and the apex do not coincide. Irregular tear film limit the repeatability of corneal curvature measurements. So all these errors you should take into account. So which keratometry device to use? Manual keratometry and automated keratometry have a low reliability. The preferred modalities, again, are optical biometry and corneal tomography. In fact, with the newer tomographical devices, you get the true net par maps, equivalent K readings. What they do is take into account both the anterior and posterior corneal surfaces while calculating the post uh, keratometry. So a keratometry is always going to be overestimated. 
in cases of keratoconus. So as you can see, this is just an equivalent K reading report that we have observed in Pentacam. So what studies have shown is that 4.5 mm is the best zone to take the keratometry for more accurate readings. So it will calculate the flat and steep K and you can in fact select the zone also in which you want to take the K readings. So this is how the vertex and pupil centric readings changes. So this is a corneal part distribution map. So same patient, same eye. These are the readings centered on the vertex and the lower ones are centered on the pupil. So as you can see, if you see the true net par, taking into account both the posterior and corneal curvature at around 3 mm, it's 49.5 if it's centered on the vertex and 47.1 if it's centered on the pupil. So you have to go towards more pupil centric pars in keratoconus. Okay, so the K is less. So the post-op hyperopia is going to be less when you're going to take these pupil centric readings. So as you can see here, and again this true net par is much lower than the simple keratometry. So that is why you have to take into account both the anterior and posterior corneal curvatures to avoid an overestimation of keratometry and a postoperative hyperopic surprise. So you can also shift the zone in which you can uh, you want to calculate the keratometry. You can edit the size of the calculation zone to get a better keratometry reading. So Various studies have observed that from mild keratoconus and moderate keratoconus, mild less than 48 and 48 to 55 they have defined as moderate. You use the actual keratometry that you obtain with either your biometers or your topographical devices. So what you get is 60% within plus minus one diopter in cases of mild keratoconus and 41.9% cases within plus minus one diopter. Much less than what you get in normal senile cataract, but still this is in the acceptable range. In cases of advanced keratoconus, more than 55 diopter, nothing works. So a standard K of 43.5 diopter has in fact found to perform better than taking all these advanced keratometry readings. Formula. All formulas result in post-operative hyperopia. That is rule number one. So target for a post-op myopia. So for a mild keratoconus less than 47 diopter, a lot of formulas, formulas work well. Different studies say some say SRK2, Hopper Q, Holiday with K adjustment, SRKT. SRK2 and SRKT both have been seen to work well. Even Barrett Universal works well. Target a myopia for at least minus one diopter. When you're moving more towards 47 to 50 diopters, moderate keratoconus, go for SRKT. Target a myopia of minus 1.5 diopter. More than 50 diopter as the K increases, all formulas become unpredictable. Large post-operative hyperopia may be seen. SRKT is still the formula to go with as per different studies Barrett Universal works well the literature is limited on that as of now avoid using the actual case standard K may be better target for a more higher degree of post of myopia minus 1.82 diopters so this is a study by Savini et al they evaluated the predictability of five different tile power calculation formula and they gave the prediction error of plus minus 0.5 diopter. So what they observed was that with SRKT, 61.9% of stage 1 keratoconus were within plus minus 0.5. And this was much higher than Barrett or Holiday. Both of them were inferior as compared to SRKT in this study. So which I will now to choose. So you should go ahead with monofocal intraocular lenses for a majority of cases. Toric IELs need careful patient selection. Again, realistic expectations. You are going to reduce the magnitude of corneal cylinder. You may not completely eliminate it. You have to document stability. The K should be stable in successive readings. The axis and the magnitude both, especially the axis, stability have to be documented. Explain the need for post-op visual rehabilitation. Spectacles, contact lenses will still be required. Multifocal IELTS, as far as multifocal IELTS are concerned, you should not implant. So this is just a case example. A 35-year-old female came with both high advanced keratoconus with intumescent cataract, stable, no progression. So optical biometry, we were unable to capture because it was a white cataract. Axial length was done with an immersion A scan, keratometry, pentacam readings were taken. Right eye phaco emulsification with IL was put. Minus one diopter expand series intraocular lens was put in the right eye. Target myopia was of minus 1.36 diopters. Post-operative uncorrected visual acuity was 624 parts. Refraction was plus 3.5 diopter sphere with minus four diopter cylinder at 103. So there was a post-op hyperopia. This is another case, a 19 year old male, both eye keratoconus with dense PSC, stable, no progression. It was a mild keratoconus case. So we went ahead with toric implantation in both eye. The cylinder, the 
maximum T9 what it could offer was uh, the cylinder was beyond the range of correction of toric aisle and customized toric the patient was not affording in which we could have gone for even higher cylinders. So in the right eye the uncorrected distance visual acuity was 69, in the left eye the uncorrected distance visual acuity was 618, corrected spectacle corrected was 612. So we could reduce the magnitude of cylinder and the visual quality and acuity both were acceptable to the patient. Of course we could not completely eliminate the cylinder in these cases. Premium eyes as I was saying enhanced monofocal intermediate visual acuity extended range of vision aisles multifocal aisles at least the patient with mild keratoconus will try to push for it that why cannot we have spectacle independence please do not go ahead with these lenses they'll induce further aberrations in an already aberrated keratoconic cornea. Just to conclude, axial length is longer than usual, optical biometry should be preferred, keratometry, the devices will overestimate the K, use topography devices and optical biometers for mild to moderate keratoconus, for advanced keratoconus, use standard K. IL power, you will have post-op hyperopia, so target myopia, more with increasing severity of keratoconus, SRKT, Barrett Universal 2, Kane keratoconus formula, all have been found to be fairly reliable. IL type go for monofocal, toric IL in mild to moderate stable disease, avoid multifocal, document the stability of disease, counsel well and go counsel for post of visual rehabilitation and there is no one size fits all. Please customize as per your patient requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Manpreet. Uh, 